to Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College. I am Mike Substelny, the instructor this semester, and we are in the sixth week of Adventure Together, where we are in the book Game Design Workshop, to talking today about uh, the uh, system dynamics of games, which is uh, chapter five, I think, in every edition of the book. Let's get right to what we're talking about today in system dynamics. Remember previously we said that the goal of games is always to entertain the players and uh, games create a structured conflict. And the game is a way for the players to resolve the conflict. The game gives you a way to resolve that in a structure. And today we're gonna talk about the systems that create those structures. Um, system, let's talk about some characteristics of systems. Systems have objects to them. In the case of backgammon here, we have our backgammon uh, pieces, the red and the black pieces, and objects themselves have properties. Some of those properties include their color and their position, so the red pieces have a different role than the black pieces in the backgammon game. Uh, the positions of the those pieces tell you something about the state of the game right now. And uh, the objects have more properties. Uh, we have, in the case of a game you made, um, an animated sprite there. We have that gif of the baby dragon. That's a property of that uh, object, is that it is an animated sprite. Um, and it has a transparent background when put into the game some of the many, many properties. You can make it a, a solid in-game maker and other things like that. You can give it a speed. All right, other things about objects. Objects have behaviors. The behavior of a red piece, for example, is it could be moved to a new position. A black piece, in the right circumstances, may also be moved to a new position. And the dice, have the behavior of generating random numbers in the game, or as random as we can make them. They're unpredictable, anyway, by a human player. Let's talk more about object behaviors. In the dragon object, by pressing a key, you can get the dragon to move. Pressing the space bar will launch a fireball from the dragon. And if you collide with a baby, that baby gets rescued. And if you collide with a demon, the game is over. Or you lose health in the case of some of the games you made. And there are other behaviors of this object. So everybody pretty clear on what we're going to use behavior and object as. Good. All right, let's talk about randomness and system dynamics. We were just using dice and backgammon to generate random numbers. And lots of games have some kind of shooting involved. And when you shoot at a target, when you propel some kind of uh, projectile toward a target, it seems to behave randomly. Um, you miss by a little bit from where you were aiming. And many games model shooting using random number generators. Um, but not all games do that. In the real world, Let's talk about randomness a little bit. Real shooting of a real projectile, it obeys the laws of physics. There's no random number generator in there really pushing it around. It should be predictable where that uh, object is going to go. Uh, in that case, they're treating shooting as probabilistic if they're using a random number generator. In real life, it's deterministic. The laws of physics determine where that projectile is going to end up. But in, the ga in most games, they used a random number generator. For example, in Armored Defense 2, um, a game that I could show you from my phone, uh, laser towers are in range, they automatically hit. They never, ever miss. It's a tower defense game. Um, and enemies have anti-missile systems that hit 50% of the time. That's a probabilistic. Thing. So if you've got a missile going toward an enemy that system and he shoots, he's going to shoot it down. 
Now, in another example, if we could go to the document camera, please. I'm going to show you. Can we uh, look at the document camera? No. Can we go to the document camera, please? Thank you. Okay, this is uh, another game on my phone that is going to model probabilistic shooting. And hmm, we're not seeing it up there. Okay. Uh, I'm going to fire my weapons that are aimed right at that target. And you'll see the shells falling in with some random amounts added to each of the shells so that they simulate what happens uh, as the shells are moving through space using a random number generator. No, that's okay. We're done. We need to go back to the camera now. Thank you. Okay. That was a to make probabilistic the shooting that in a real battleship would have been deterministic. And I like battleships, so we'll talk more about them today. All right, so let's talk about some more of the uh, system dynamics in this game. This play field shows the position, orientation, and terrain involved in the game. And these are all part of the system dynamics. Uh, we care about positions and orientations in lots of games, not just ones where they're shooting. But because I've started talking about battleships, let's talk about this old board game from back in the 80s, uh, Battle Wagon, with battleships shooting each other, and we'll simulate a famous naval battle between the Hood and the Bismarck, because it's easy to show their uh, uh, stats for just two ships. Um, we used a hex map to regularize the relationships of positions and movement. And you've probably seen hex maps used in games. They're a pretty standard way of uh, determining positions and orientations and terrain in a game. All right, this game used a ship systems display to show the characteristics of the ship, also a part of system dynamics. They've got all these numbers associated with them. The 15 A's on the hood are showing the 15 inch guns on the hood. The 15 C's are showing the 15 inch German guns, which are significantly better on the Bismarck. And all these numbers have meanings on tables in the game that interact with each other to simulate what those real ships would have done. Um, and so uh, the object properties are represented by these numbers and letters on this display here. And the dice will be used to simulate the uh, probabilistic things that are actually deterministic but are so minute that a human being can't... Uh, can't calculate them. So uh, we notice on these the armor thickness of the Bismarck is significantly heavier uh, on the deck five inches than on the hoods two inches. Um, and that turned out historically to be pretty significant when they fought each other. And here are some of the tables that are used in the game. You don't have to really memorize this, just understand lots of games use tables like this to resolve what happens when units interact with each other. This is the heart of system dynamics. And some computer games have something like this to resolve uh, what happens when you interact also. But the players generally wouldn't have to look at the table in a computer game. And so this table, these tables, are used to resolve all the system dynamics things that happens when the units go against each other. So here's the scenario between the Bismarck and the Hood. They're 30,000 yards apart. Um, that's 15 hexes, about 15 miles, and they're turning to bear their guns on each other. And let's talk about probability a little bit before they shoot at each other. Um, we're using dice in this game again. Uh, you use dice in lots of games. And when you roll two six-sided dice, you have 11 possible outcomes. The lowest number you can roll is a two. That's a one and a one with snake eyes. But you could roll a 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And the highest thing you can roll when adding two six-sided dice together is a 12. 
it turns out that we know that not all of these combinations are equally probable. In fact, the only way you can get a 2 is if both dice come up 1. If the first dice comes up, uh, the first die comes up a 1 and the second die comes up a 2, you can get a 3. If the first die comes up with a 1, you can also roll a 4. If the first die comes up 1, you can roll a 5 or a 6 or a 7. If the second die comes up a, if the first die comes up a 2, however, sorry, if the first die comes up a 2, the lowest thing you can roll is a 3. You cannot get snake eyes once that first 2 is rolled. And so we expand on. You can roll a 4, a 5, a 6, a 7, and on and on and on to generate, whoops, I want to show that. Yes, this is all the possible combinations you can get rolling two dice. There are 36 possible results here. And only one gives you a 2, and only one gives you a 12. But there are lots of combinations that yield a 7. Look at that. A 1 and a 6, a 2 and a 5, a 3 and a 4, a 5 and a 2, a 6 and a 1, or a 4 and a 3. All of those results yield a 7 for you. And so the 7 is much more likely to come up. In fact, out of the 36 possible results, you've got a 1 in 36 chance of rolling 2, and you've got a 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in 36 chance of rolling a 7. And so we build that uh, there and call that the binomial probability distribution. There are lots of binomial probability distributions. You can get one out of... Uh, rolling two four-sided dice or two 20-sided dice or other combinations like that. We use it to simulate the bell curve, the normal distribution, and that's as far as we're going to go in math in this class. You don't have to be able to do this calculation or anything. Just understand the characteristics of the dice are leading us to this is a likely result, this is an unlikely result when we make our system dynamics tables. So what will happen in our battle between these two great warships? Well, if we look at those tables, you can see that at the range they're at right now, one of them is at long range, the hood. The blue is indicating the Bismarck's at medium range. And uh, according to the table we've got here of medium versus long range for eight guns firing, you're going to most likely generate more hits here. Here are the die rolls. And as modified by the Bismarck's crack gun crews, you're probably familiar from gaming what modifiers are and things like that. So what we've got here is a situation where this ship is a lot more likely to do more damage than that ship is, even though they, they kind of look similar to each other. And what in fact happened historically was that the uh, Bismarck destroyed the hood very quickly. Okay, let's talk about, the in what we just discussed, uh, a battleship is an object. A gun might be an object. A shell might be an object. That object will have properties somehow modeled in the game. And that object will also have behaviors, uh, which is uh, generally modeled in tables or probabilistically or deterministically. And they will have relationships like their positions or their lengths or their speeds relative to each other, things like that going on in games. And you can see that uh, the armor difference in those ships, the fact that the Bismarck can penetrate 4.7 inches of armor and the poor hood has only 2 inches of armor, um, it was not well protected for that battle whereas the Bismarck was pretty well protected against the hood. All right, let's talk about other things in system dynamics to wrap up today. There are economies in system dynamics. Lots of games, especially online games, have economies in them. Uh, it can be a simple barter economy where you swap things with other players or with non-player entities in the game. Could be a simple market where things are put up for sale in the game, as in the case of here where you can buy seeds. Oh geez, do I have an animation going there? Okay. can be a complex market. I am sorry for subjecting you to the Farmville music. 
can be a complex market where uh, people put things up for sale. Uh, other players might sell things to each other using in-game or out-of-game currency. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's talk about some meta economies. They're becoming more and more common and more and more viable in games. Here we have Magic the Gathering, where there is a meta economy. Uh, it's a game of, uh, you're probably familiar with it. It's a dueling game. Two players take their decks of cards and they do a magical duel against each other. And they have the same deck of cards. They have whatever cards they own. They buy, sell, trade cards with real currency in the real world to build their decks. And that is a meta economy. Outside the game, there is an economy of buying, selling, trading going on. And uh, kind of a new meta economy game I've started playing recently, uh, Star Trek Attack Wing, takes it one step further. They not only have cards, but little toy spaceships that you buy, sell, trade, and use against each other. And this is also a game where you can duel with more than two players uh, at a time, conceivably. You could have a lot of players uh, fighting against each other using their toy spaceships. Um, meta economy in, uh, oh, that is Second Life. Second Life has, was one of the first meta economies in online gaming where um, lots of money was spent buying islands and making different structures and things like that, uh, especially early in the history of Second Life. And that meta economy made the news. Uh, just about all the Facebook games these days have a meta economy. This is an example of one I, I don't think I play that anymore. But uh, you can buy things, trade with other players, sell things online, and you can earn currency by watching commercials and things like that. Very uh, profitable in gaming. At least it was for a while. We'll talk about that next week. All right, let's talk about emergent systems. That's another part of system dynamics. Emergence is when simple rules yield complex results. And in the gaming industry, we like that because we like having simple rules and players like experiencing complex uh, experiences in their games. Uh, for example, the stock market. It's rules of the stock market are very, very simple. But the results of the stock market are extremely complex uh, to the point where it's still and probably never will be completely predictable. Once upon a time, emergent systems was a topic for philosophers and such, but with the advent of microcomputers and computers, it's now affecting game designers and game players. Anybody able to think of an example of emergence in gaming that you've experienced? Anyone in the classroom? All right, I'll throw out an example here. Um, intentional emergence exists in, uh, this is a Sims game. In the Sims, the rules are pretty simple. And they hope, the designers of the game hope that these simple units interacting with each other will create complex relationships, complex interactions that will amuse the player. And that's really all there is to the game. These simple rules yield fascinatingly complicated results in, uh, in all the Sims games. Um, Farmville is an example of unintentional emergence, where the players discover um, something about the game and a new way to play emerges, and they interact in a way never planned. Uh, if anybody ever played Farmville, this was a very common thing to do. Everybody built a little pile of haystacks around themselves on a little bit of their land in order to make play go faster. The designers of Farm Bill wanted you to spend as much time as possible uh, playing their game, looking at their screen, and so you would be s grinding all day long. But uh, they discovered that if your player, if your little character couldn't move, the animations went quicker. So all the players of that game started doing that in order to spend less time playing. Does that seem strange to you? A game where you want to spend less time playing? But that was the exact thing that emerged. 
Okay, here's another example. A new way to play the game not intended by its creators. Halo 2. Anybody aware of what happened there? When the players discovered BXRing with their controller. It was a way that you could... Uh, it was a button combination not planned by the game designers that allowed you to simultaneously shoot in rapid melee all at the same time. And it became really popular uh, and the players everywhere started playing that way. The game designers had no clue that that was possible when they created it. It's a very famous example of uh, unintended emergence that made it into the mainstream. All right, that's it for this time. Next time will be a very exciting lecture. We're going to get further into things like The Sims and uh, other online Facebook games when we talk about social games. We'll also talk about